A British airline was forced to divert one of its flights to Turkey after the co-pilot died in flight of natural causes. Well, the Airbus A320 was flying from Manchester to Cyprus. The airline did not give a cause of death. Well, meanwhile, there was panic in the skies aboard a flight to New York as a woman gasped for air. Uh, Deborah Farrick describes the attempts to save her and the controversy that followed. Gasping for air, Corrine Desir knew she was in serious trouble. My darling, please don't let me die. Go ask some oxygen for me, please, baby. I love you, baby. I love you. Don't let me die. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, please. And I stopped yelling in the plane. Somebody help me. Her cousin, Antonio Oliver, tells CNN affiliate WABC he begged an American Airlines flight attendant twice to bring him oxygen. Please, sir. Bring me some oxygen for her. He said it is impossible. It's unclear how much time elapsed, but soon after, American Airlines says the captain asked passengers for help. Three doctors and four medical personnel on board tried saving the Brooklyn resident. Her cousin describes it this way. When they open the oxygen tank, there's nothing in the tank. Desir's cousin says a second oxygen canister also failed, as did an automatic defibrillator normally used to jumpstart the heart. Was it working? How do you know? The because the doctor said nothing is working in the plane. I can't believe it. One of the doctors, through a lawyer, says he can't confirm exactly how much oxygen was in the canister. And while an American Airlines spokesman acknowledges they're investigating why the defibrillator did not administer a shock as it should have, the airline says, quote, we stand behind the actions and training of our crew and the functionality of the onboard medical equipment. Flight attendants are supposed to respond to the emergency in a timely and efficient way. If, they, if a flight attendant does not, the airline may be liable for whatever happens to the passenger. The passengers performed CPR for 45 minutes as the captain prepared to divert to Miami. But after Ms. Desir breathed her last, she was laid out in the first class aisle and the captain continued to the flight's destination, New York. There, the medical examiner said Ms. Desir died of natural causes due to diabetes and heart disease. The Federal Aviation Administration says it is investigating the entire incident. Deborah Feyerick, CNN, New York. Well, whatever happened, it was plainly a terrifying ordeal, a medical emergency in mid-flight. Dr. John McKnight knows something about feeling helpless when trying to help someone in the air when someone is uh, the victim of a medical emergency. He joins us now from Los Angeles. I want to talk about your experiences in just a moment, Dr. McKnight, and it's great to have you with us. But first, your, just, your reaction to what you heard about the case there of Ms. Desir. Well, I was very surprised. I uh, awakened this morning, uh, 10 years after an experience that I was involved with, which we uh, went to great lengths to try to get legislation and accomplish that passed uh, through Congress. Uh, and this was again 10 years ago and now uh, I awaken to see that uh, someone uh, died allegedly from having uh, inadequate equipment on board a flight. So what happened to you? Well, in, uh, around end of December of 1997 I was on a flight from uh, New York to Miami with my family and a 23 year old woman on the flight uh, had a, went into cardiac arrest and for 30 minutes while the plane was making an emergency landing, we, my, me and an uh, uh, EMT uh, emergency technician who was on board tried to save the, uh, this passenger's life, uh, but they had inadequate uh, uh, flight attendant training. They had uh, bare essentials on, a, on the flight kit. They had no uh, defibrillator, um, and as a result, it was uh, all in vain. So in this latest case, we're hearing that there was a defibrillator, but there are, there are reports that it didn't work properly, uh, that the oxygen didn't work properly. There's been statements from American Airlines saying that oxygen was administered and the defibrillator was applied, but plainly it seems something wasn't working right. Well, it, I agree. Again, I wasn't there, but uh, it seems to me that uh, this has caught a lot of media attention, and I don't think it would have uh, uh, necessarily if it was... Um, everything that the airline's saying, but obviously there's two sides to the story. One thing that I find is interesting is that the doctor, one of the doctors, ha already is being represented by an attorney as their spokesperson, which is kind of unusual uh, in this situation, particularly since part of our 
uh, legislation back in 1998 was the first ever federal Good Samaritan law, which protects doctors that come forward from a lawsuit in this case. So, with your legislation, how widely is it now applied? Is it only for flights that uh, begin or end in the United States or domestic flights? And what is required now to be carried on board planes? Well, I, you know, the initially it was international flights. A lot of the international flights already had to expand in medical kits and defibrillators. Those are the critical flights because it's overseas usually and it's uh, lengthy flights uh, where you can't make an emergency landing. Uh, and so those were already fairly well equipped. That's what's even more surprising in this case is that here a flight from, uh, you know, uh, going overseas was not equipped. Uh, but the, with the legislation, the goal was also to have uh, f short flights, domestic flights equipped with uh, expanded medical kits. Uh, uh, oxygen, in this case, is, are the bare essentials, but to have expanded medical kits and a, a working defibrillator that's uh, looked at daily to make certain that, these, uh, that this equipment is, uh, is functional. Now, Ms. Dazir was 44 years old. She plainly had uh, underlying medical conditions. This uh, co-pilot who's died on a British flight uh, on its way to Cyprus, he was 43 years old. Is flying inherently more dangerous than, than not flying in terms of health conditions? And what cues should you be listening to in terms of your own body to say, don't get on the plane, it may not be the best place to be if something goes bad? Well, it, it, you know, it is, by and large, it's inherently safe. We all do it every day, and most, and most people do fine with the flight. But, uh, but these are young people. I mean, 43 and 44, uh, that even it, with medical conditions, that's still an early age to, uh, to have a problem. And, and to say that they're, because they have a medical condition, that... Uh, you know that they this they couldn't uh, you know be uh, brought back with the right equipment. Uh, I think is is not accurate. I think that with the proper equipment, these are the people uh, that could easily be saved. Well, certainly through your experiences, you change the law, and 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 for the benefit of everyone who flies, as so many of us do, we uh, really do thank you for uh, for taking time with us today, Dr. John McKnight, joining us from my Los pleasure. Angeles.